Good morning. Happy Monday. Hope you all had a good weekend. Nice to have you here. Uh, what we're going to do today is continue talking about molecular orbital theory. We're talking about the two main theories used in chemistry to describe the why, why molecules form, uh, the different patterns and stuff that can be used. We went through hybridization theory, which was SP, SP2, SP3, that kind of jazz, and now we're going through molecular orbital theory. Um, this Friday, uh, the lab, uh, we turned in the Lewis Structures Lab. We started uh, last Friday. Problem set number two is up, which will have BB and ML kind of problems. Quiz number two. And then we'll also do the BB versus ML lab. So we can compare some molecules directly. The ML stuff we're doing is limited to diatomics, two atoms, and only up to neon. So there's not a lot of comparisons, but there are some things you can do with stuff that we'll see. Any questions? Cool. So what I'm going to do is show a video that we ended with on Friday about building a molecular orbital diagram for hydrogen, H2. And this is kind of cool for us because in Chem 221, I made you all memorize, have no fear of ice clear root, the seven diatomics. And this is a rationalization as to why H2 is H2 and not just H by itself. <coughs> Contrast to valence bond theory, which assigns bonding orbitals to individual atoms, molecular orbital theory assigns the orbitals involved in bonding to the entire molecule. The simplest illustration of molecular orbital theory can be seen with the hydrogen molecule. According to molecular orbital theory, the 1s atomic orbitals of the two hydrogen atoms combine to give two molecular orbitals. Because atomic orbitals are wave functions, they can combine either constructively or destructively. Additive or constructive combination of the two atomic orbitals gives a bonding molecular orbital, while subtractive or destructive combination of the two atomic orbitals gives an anti-bonding molecular orbital. The bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals formed by the combination of two 1s orbitals are called sigma 1s and sigma star 1s, respectively. The bonding molecular orbital, sigma 1s, is lower in energy than the original atomic orbitals. And the anti-bonding molecular orbital, sigma star 1s, is higher in energy than the original atomic orbitals. Like atomic orbitals, molecular orbitals can accommodate a maximum of two electrons each with the electrons in the ground state occupying the lowest possible energy orbitals. The molecular orbitals in the hydrogen molecule can be represented with lines or boxes placed at the appropriate relative energy levels. The two electrons in the hydrogen molecule both occupy the bonding molecular orbital. Because most of the sigma 1s bonding molecular orbital is located between the two nuclei, Electrons in this orbital draw the two nuclei together by electrostatic attraction. The sigma star 1s antibonding molecular orbital consists of two lobes. The majority of the space occupied by the two lobes does not lie between the two nuclei. In this molecular orbital, the region between the two lobes is known as a node. Electrons in this orbital would actually draw the two nuclei apart by electrostatic forces. Hydrogen has no electrons in this anti-bonding molecular orbital. Okay. <clears throat> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> to a point, right? If you're new to this stuff, it's a little weird. So let's break it down a little bit more. If we were to draw a Lewis structure for H2, all right, uh, we first think about the number of valence electrons. Hydrogen has just one, literally, and there's two of them. So one times two would be two valence electrons or one pair. And if we drew the Lewis structure, uh, that's what it would look like. But let's think a little deeper about this here, too. What would be the bond order of H2 according to this Lewis structure? One. That's right. You draw one line, it's a bond order one. Two lines would be bond order two. Is this one line a sigma or a pi bond? Sigma. Sigma, right on. Sigma is just when orbitals smash into each other. It's the overlap and stuff. So the Lewis structure for H2 shows a bond order one and a sigma bond, all right? And if a molecular orbital diagram or hybridization or anything is gonna do justice to these, it better give you the same thing. 
So this picture is the molecular orbital diagram for H2, all right? Now, as we've talked about on Friday, the far left and the far right are the hydrogen atoms by themselves. And hydrogen is a 1s1. So initially, you could have like an arrow in each of these boxes if you'd like. That's what that arrow means. And they can be up or down either way. And by the way, in Chem 221, two electrons per orbital. One is spin up, one is spin down. And we draw that with an arrow up and an arrow down. Now, two atomic orbitals coming together to make a molecular orbital diagram. Two atomic orbitals make two molecular orbitals. And one of them is lower in energy. It's called the bonding molecular orbital. But they have to make another one. Symmetry is big in science. So the anti-bonding molecular orbital is higher energy like that. And scientists give it a little star right there to show that it's higher energy. So one electron on each side, when the molecular, the H2, forms, both of the electrons are able to go to the lower orbital. All right? And so two electrons in a bonding molecular orbital is good for the molecule, all right? So in this case, as we're gonna see here in a little bit, they're gonna happen. Now, in the Lewis structure, <clears throat> this was a sigma bond, which is right on. Notice that this is a sigma molecular orbital, and we have two electrons in the sigma bonding orbital. This is gonna represent this one bond right there. And also, as we'll see here in a little bit, we have more bonding electrons than anti-bonding. And we're gonna use that information to also tell that this uh, bond order one that we see here is also exhibited right here. So there's a lot of similarities between them. All right, there's more you can get out of MO than Lewis structures, honestly, but all of this stuff should be present there as well. Now, <clears throat> Earlier I said how have no fear of ice clear brute, and those were the seven diatomics, and dihelium was not one of them. Well, now maybe you can start to see why dihelium is not part of the list. Helium is a 1s2, it has one more electron than hydrogen. So you've got 1s2 from the helium atom on the left, and 1s2 from the helium atom on the right. Now, just like before, two atomic orbitals make two molecular orbitals, the part in the middle. And again, I want to highlight, it's only the middle part which shows the molecule, all right? The far left and the far right of the atoms. Um, the two electrons plus two electrons, the four electrons total from the two helium atoms, they go to the lowest MO first, and they just progressively work their way higher. So in this case, the bonding orbital and the anti-bonding orbital each have the same number of electrons. Now, if science fiction is your jam, and if it isn't, I won't hold it against you by means. But matter and antimatter, when they come together, it's never a good call, all right? And that's what we're seeing right here. We're seeing bonding, which is like regular matter, and anti-bonding, which is like antimatter. And bonding and anti-bonding, we're gonna see if their number of electrons are equal, they cancel out. And if we tried to draw a Lewis structure of dihelium, you could do it because helium is a single electron, only handles one bond, all the kind of same things. So we can't really draw dihelium as a Lewis structure. We can't really think here that dihelium is gonna exist. So let's extend MO a little bit more and talk about bond order for molecular orbital theory. Now in a Lewis structure, bond order is literally the number of lines between the two atoms in a, in a particular bond. The molecular orbital theory description of bond order is a little bit different. It's one half parentheses, bonding electrons minus anti-bonding electrons. So if you have a bond order for a molecular orbital diagram, which is greater than zero, we're gonna consider that molecule to exist. It's gonna be stable, okay? And you can see it's greater than zero, so 0.5 is actually gonna be a possibility for some of these molecules. On the other hand, we will see some bond orders that are equal to zero. And you can, although we won't see it in this class, have bond orders less than zero when there's bits of special cases. Either way, all of those unstable, nothing that we're gonna talk about in Chem 222 as being something we can show to each other. So, 
back to the dihydrogen H2 diagram. In the molecular orbital part, the part in the middle, we have two bonding and zero antibonding. All right, remember the star is the antibonding. So if I said, what's the bond order for H2? Well, one half parentheses, bonding electrons, two, minus antibonding electrons, which are zero, one half of two is one. Stable molecule. Notice that this is equal to the bond order of the Lewis structure we talked about earlier, all right? So bond order of one is what we get for the MO diagram for H2, and it shows that it's stable. That's why hydrogen was the have in have no fear of ice clear through the diatomics. It's a molecule that absolutely exists. Um, we're gonna see, and we'll talk about this later, that those two electrons are in the sigma orbital. So this is not only a bond order one, it's also a sigma bond, and we'll see this here later. Now, Dihelium, on the other hand, was not one of the ones we saw. So this now is the diagram, the MO diagram for HE2 dihelium. And notice in this molecule, two bonding uh, or bonding electrons in the sigma 1s and two anti-bonding electrons in the sigma star 1s. So going through our same bond order analysis, we would go one half, two minus two, Zero. Dihelium is not expected to be stable. It's not expected to be around. All right. And we can't draw a Lewis diagram for a Lewis structure diagram for it that makes any sense. So backing it up, good models should be able to use Lewis structures and extend. And that's what MO does. It's a little different though. Like instead of just looking at the number of bonds for bond order, in MO we go one half bonding electrons minus anti-bonding electrons. And uh, in this case we saw that dihydrogen bond order one, just like we see in the Lewis structure. And in the Lewis structure the first bond is sigma, and that's what we're seeing right here based on the types of orbitals and stuff that are coming together. Any questions? All right. Now, the fourth principle, there's four big principles of MO, and this one is uh, the most perplexing on one level. Atomic orbitals will combine to make molecular orbitals only if they're in the same energy, similar kind of energy. If there's a big difference in energy, then they won't make molecular orbitals. But if they are similar energy, then you'll start seeing uh, or molecular orbitals form. So similar energy means better overlap. You have better mixing of the pieces. So what that means for us, okay, is that 1s plus 1s, good molecular orbital diagram. But 1s and 2s, if you remember from Chem 221, a 2s was quite a bit higher than 1s. So 1s and 2s wouldn't mix very well, and people don't usually see those. But 2s and 2s is great. 2s and 2p, pretty bad. 3s and 2s, pretty bad, uh, too. They have to be, for us, similar energies. Now, I said how in Chem 222, we're only gonna see diatomics up to neon. So neon is at the end of the 2p6 area. When you start getting to 3s, which is sodium and magnesium, or 3p, aluminum through argon, the orbitals are closer in energy and you start to see three S's mix with three P's and you go a little further and then it gets even more complex because four S, three D, four P start mixing together. And uh, it gets a lot more difficult to explain as your instructor <laughs> what's going on. So in this class, we're trying to just give like an overview. That's why we're only going up to dineon, all right? You start getting into disodium and you start having mixing with three Ps and things just get a little bit more interesting, shall we say. <laughs> uh, that's for other classes, all right? So in our class, we're only gonna look at the best overlap, which means up to neon, all right? Past neon, you have to take higher courses. Fascist chemist. Questions on? So, which one of these combinations would you expect to have the best molecular orbitals? All right. 
And here's 1s plus 2p, 2p plus 3p, 3d and 3d, 4d and 4f, and 5g. And by the way, 5g is the one we haven't quite gotten to yet in chemistry, but we're getting closer and stuff like that. Well, if they have to be similar energy, then you'd ideally like them to be the same kind of orbital. So which of these would you expect to have the best overlap? C. C, that's right. The 3D and 3D uh, should be the best orbitals possible, and we would expect those to do it. Now, the 3D and 3D is pretty cool stuff, and that's a subject of the future, of course, anytime. Uh, but for this class, we can at least predict that because they're the same types of orbitals, they should have the best overlap, all right? Like 1s and 2p, we'll see examples of this, and there's quite an energy differential between these. And these start mixing together. Questions? Cool. Dilithium. Star Trek, yeah, antimatter, makes you go. Dilithium supposedly was able to somehow contain antimatter and it was never explained. And in the real world, dilithium I, it hasn't, I don't think is as exciting as Star Trek. However, uh, dilithium apparently has kind of a red glow to it. This is supposedly a picture that somebody made, I don't know. But anyway, either, neither here nor there. Dilithium is a compound that can be made. So Star Trek people like myself get all excited. You don't have to like Star Trek to get an A in this class. Now, lithium, the atom, 1s2, 2s1. So you can see here, like on the left-hand side, the orangish boxes, that's a lithium atom. And the right side, 1s2, 2s1, this is a second lithium atom. So dilithium is represented by the molecular orbitals in the middle. Now, there's some diff similarities and some differences here. So you can see that in the 1s's, which is what we saw for helium and hydrogen uh, diatomics, uh, 1s, sigma 1s, and sigma star 1s are filled. So bonding and antibonding, they cancel each other out. These are just kind of sitting there and not doing anything. But the exciting part, at least to chemists who are into Star Trek, is up here. Because now we've got a 2s1 and a 2s1 coming together, just like we saw for dihydrogen. And instead of being in the sigma 1s, these are in what's called the sigma 2s, all right? But you have more bonding electrons than antibonding, which would be up here. So if you wanted to do the bond order, bonding minus antibonding and half of that. So two bonding here and two bonding here, four bonding electrons total. And antibonding, there's two there, and this one has zero, which is also antibonding. So the complete version would be one half parentheses, four bonding minus two, antibonding, one bond, all right? And again, anytime you have a bond order greater than zero, molecule should exist, all right? Now, notice how the lower diagram down here has just as many bonding and anti-bonding. It's totally cool if you want to ignore the lower electrons, like if they're filled like this, and you can just focus on the top part. So you could have just as well went one half two minus zero and gotten the same number, all right? These are the core electrons, all right? This is the big part about that. So lithium, when we talked about it, uh, you know, it had one valence and two core, all right? Well, cores literally just sit there. There's no, there, the bonding and the anti-bonding amounts cancel each other out. There's no reason for them to form. So punchline, if you wanna find bond order on just the top level, Diberyllium would be Be2, all right? And beryllium is number four on the periodic table. So beryllium has one more electron than lithium does. What do you think, dibrillium? Yes or no? Wait, wait, you said number four? Yeah. As in four is a what, group number? Four is the oh, atomic number. Atomic number. Right. Yeah. Yep. So it would be number of protons, but we're talking about neutral versions. So it would be four electrons on each beryllium. Okay. Um, Where would the extra electrons go in the molecular orbital diagram? It seems like it would just be like helium. Yes. It would be just like helium. I like that answer. Now, here's what Aiden saw, and I bet a lot of you saw too. Instead of having 2s1, 
which is what lithium has, there would be 2s2. So this would be two electrons and this would be two electrons. So we've got a total of four electrons, just like helium. Two of them would be in the bonding sigma 2s and two of them would be in the anti-bonding sigma star 2s. And again, if you have just as many in the lower bonding and the, and the upper anti-bonding, they're all going to cancel out. You don't believe me? Figure out the bond order, all right? Because if you had two more electrons right there, you'd have one half two plus two bonding minus two plus two for beryllium antibonding, one half four minus four. And that's going to be zero unstable molecule. So diberyllium has, to my knowledge, never been um, examined or anything like that, just like dihelium. They're just too stable, you could argue. Any questions? Now, we are going to look at interactions between the two p orbitals. Now, we've seen hydrogen and helium, which are the 1s. We've seen lithium and beryllium, which are the 2s. And we're going to look at the 2p interactions, so the boron through neon examples. Now, 2p's have three orbitals on each atom. So we talked in Chem 221 how the P's were basically like figure eights. And those figure eights were at 90 degrees. So we can think about it, one was a Z axis, one was an X axis, one was a Y axis. So three orbitals, different orientations. When the two atoms, each with two P orbitals come together, each atom has three orbitals. So there's gonna be six total molecular orbitals in these diagrams. Of the six uh, orbitals that come together, two of them are going to be sigma. You're going to have a bonding sigma and an anti-bonding sigma. And the other four are going to make pi molecular orbitals. And like before, two bonding pi, two anti-bonding pi. So six molecular orbitals, two sigma and four pi, three of them will be bonding and three of them will be anti-bonding. So the problem with this, though, is that there's a little bit of a difference where you are on the periodic table. So while the 1s and 2s, there was only one diagram that fit everything, the 2p's, there's actually going to be two different combinations, and I'll show you that. If you have the first three 2p elements, boron, carbon, and nitrogen. And again, quick review, these six box columns on the right-hand side, not helium, helium belongs under really here. These six are the 2P, all right? So the first three elements are B, C, N. Now, a lot of times I'll talk about this as NBC, because NBC rings a bell with people, uh, of course, for TV and stuff like that. But anyway, if you have the NBC or BCN elements, the diagram for the two P's looks like this. And I'll refer to this as the 2121. The pi's are lower than the sigma. Then you go pi star, sigma star. So this is a diagram, a molecular orbital diagram for diboron, B2. Now boron is a 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. And I have another boron here on the left side. It's another 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Like diberyllium, which was like helium, like Aiden pointed out, the two s's cancel out. You have just as many bonding as anti-bonding. But the interesting part here for boron is up here, because you have one bonding, one electron on each 2p orbital. And using this 2121, which is pi sigma, pi star, sigma star, each electron goes down here. Now, Hund's rule says keep each electron in its own orbital whenever possible and only pair up if there's no more room. So in this case, one electron goes in each pi 2p orbital. But the punchline here is that you do have more bonding electrons than anti-bonding. So diboron is going to exist. 
To figure out bond order here, you can ignore this one or include it, either way. Um, if you include everything, bond order is one half bonding electrons, two, three, four, this one's empty, so one half of four, minus anti-bonding electrons, two here, but these are all empty. So one half parentheses, four minus two, bond order one. NBC, boron carbon nitrogen, is a two one two one, pi sigma, pi star, sigma star. And why that's important is because the phone, F-O-N-E, or oxygen fluorine neon, the next three on there, take a slightly different orientation. Now, here's sigma 1s's, here's the sigma 2s's. Two, uh, two this is the action. Now, in the last slide, pi's were lower than sigma. But for phone, or O-F-N-E, sigma is lower than pi's. So this is a one, two, two, one diagram. Sigma, pi, pi star, sigma star. All right, let me summarize this. N, B, C, everybody seems to remember that better, is a two, one, two, one. Pi, sigma, pi star, sigma star. Phone, F-O-N-E, which are the next three, one, two, two. Sigma, pi, next plate, pi star, sigma star. There's two different diagrams depending on which atoms you have. This is a much more powerful diagram, we'll see, but they really are different. So let's say Clifford says, oh, Dr. Russell, what's the molecular orbital diagram we would use for dicarbon C2? No problem, I'd say Clifford. Carbon is one of the NBCs. So we would use the one on the previous slide, two, one, two, one. It's different from this one because these two are lower and this one is a little bit higher. The anti-bonding parts, the two ones are the same on the end. It's the bonding parts which flip, all right? They say it has to do with electron repulsion. I'm, I'm not really sure if I, I believe that all the way, but that's what people see, okay? On the other hand, Aiden says, boy, I've got some fluorine F2 around. Which diagram am I gonna use? say, hey, definitely use the phone, F-O-N-E. And that is gonna have sigma lower than pi, but the pi star and the sigma star will still there. So one, two, two, one, versus two, one, two, one. Questions? This is dioxygen. Dioxygen's really famous when it comes to molecular orbital diagrams. We'll see why in a little bit. Um, on this diagram, they have ignored the, the 1s interactions, which is fine, they're core. Really, you could ignore the 2s, and I'll talk about ways to not, you don't have to draw all this out later too. But the exciting part is up here. Now, when you're counting for oxygen, and you want the two p's, you need to start right here, all right? Because this is 2p1, 2p2, 2p3, 2p4. So in this diagram, there's four electrons on oxygen number one and four electrons on oxygen number two. So that's eight electrons total. And if you count in the middle here, two, four, six, seven, eight, that's what we've got. Now, when you have those eight electrons, the first two go here, one up and one down. The third and the fourth one each go in their own box in the pi bonding. The fifth and the sixth one pair up the pi's. And the seventh and the eighth ones go up there, all right? They're gonna be in the pi star. And again, by Hun's rule, uh, you should have to keep those electrons in opposite boxes. Now, if you're really ready to get excited, and I'm sure you're really excited by molecular orbital theory, but anyway, oxygen, the Lewis structure, when you draw it out, and I'll let you do that for fun later, looks like this, all right? The oxygen molecule diatomic has a double bond in the middle. This would be a bond order two. The first line is a sigma, the second line is a pi, all right? Well, Sigma and no anti-sigma, that's where that one comes from. But what's really interesting here is that when it comes to the pi, there's four pi's and two anti-pi's. 
So if you think about just pi, one half parentheses four minus two, that is the pi bond that we're drawing in a Lewis structure. But why, I'd kind of like you to get excited, and it's probably not like, oh boy, I got to be pizza excited, but anyway, I want you to get a little bit excited because there's these two anti-electrons, and one of them is kind of breaking up this pi bond a little bit, you can think about it, and one of them's kind of breaking up this pi bond. So what that means, O2, paramagnetic. Now, if I draw this, like, this Lewis structure, there's no like odd electrons, all right? Everything is paired. Two bonding pairs here, two bond, or sorry, thank you for playing. Two lone pairs on each oxygen and two bonding pairs in the middle, that's what I was trying to get across. But they're all pairs, all right? There's no odd electrons. We saw some examples of Lewis structures where there was a single electron on atoms to show, but that's not what we see with O2. The O2 Lewis structure makes it look diamagnetic, no single electrons. But molecular orbital clearly shows that there are odd electrons inside. And I showed a video the other day of oxygen like sticking to the middle of the magnet. It sticks because of these electrons. And again, that's something you would not expect to see in a Lewis structure. So MO can be really cool for chemists, all right? There's a lot more information, all right? And we're seeing even right now like an example of it. Um, so this just shows that MO has a lot of potential. Prof that off, uh, truth, in, uh, truth in advertising, I used to study paramagnetic things, so I get a little excited when I see odd electrons. Perhaps you don't feel the passion yet and stuff, however, they are pretty cool. All right, Prof that there. Questions? Yeah. So the two spin-ups on the anti-pi canceled the spin-ups on the regular pi? Yeah, or, or, or just spin down. Clifford, all we have to say is that one of these electrons, if you will, kind of cancels one of these, but you, okay. you still have electrons by themselves, all right? And being, something, being paramagnetic is uh, huge in terms of reactivity, and this diagram doesn't show that at all, but here, yeah, either you, you can see there's odd electrons that I haven't canceled out, okay? And that's why this is kind of exciting for chemists. Good, good question. All right. Now, <clears throat> paramagnetism is when you have an odd electron, and we saw paramagnetism and diamagnetism in Chem 221, so we talked about how, like, for example, uh, 1s2, every up has a down electron, so that's diamagnetic. On the other hand, if you had just 1s1 a hydrogen atom, there would be an odd electron. The up doesn't have a down. So if you have an up without a down or a down without an up, that's uh, what we talked about is paramagnetic. And it's the same thing in these kind of structures. Molecular orbital diagram is similar to the atomic orbitals we looked at. So O2 is paramagnetic. It's these two electrons that point it out, all right? And that's why it's really important that you give each electron its own box, all right? Don't start pairing up until there's nothing left. These electrons down here are all diamagnetic. If every up has a down, then it's diamagnetic. And it takes just one unpaired electron to make the whole thing paramagnetic. So O2, we would definitely say, is paramagnetic. It would have two unpaired electrons, so it's more into uh, magnets and stuff like that. Now, this diagram is for N2. Now, N2, we've shifted. We had the phone before, the 1, 2, 2, 1 diagram. N2 is the other one, the NBC. It's a 2, 1, 2, 1. And the 2 is the pi. Here's the 1 sigma. 2 pi star, 1 sigma star. This part was the same in the description. This is the part that's flipped. Now, nitrogen is a 2p3 in the atom. So we'd have 2p3 on the left and 2p3 on the right, six electrons total. So when you put these electrons in this 2, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, pairs them up, 5, 6, every up has a down. So the molecular orbital diagram for N2 predicts it's going to be diamagnetic. And that's what you would see if you drew the Lewis structure. All right. 
N2 has a triple bond, a bond order three, which you would see here, six minus zero and half of that. But more importantly, N2 is diamagnetic as a Lewis structure. There's no odd electrons. And the molecular orbital diagram for N2 is diamagnetic. So most molecules, Lewis structures and animals, will be the same. But the O2 is one of the exceptions, and that's a better descriptor they feel for these kind of molecules. All right. So here's a question that molecular orbitals also really just excel at. And the question is, is N2 plus paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Now in Chem 221, we would take atoms and you can make a positive ion or a negative ion by either taking away or adding electrons. Now N2 plus is missing one electron. So you've got to pull one of the electrons out. And Mother Nature, just like all of us, basically lazy. So what that means, not no disrespect to Mother Nature, by the way, we're going to take away an electron from the highest orbital, all right? Because those are going to be the easiest ones to take out. So one of these electrons, up or down, doesn't matter, is going to be out of here when you make N2+. plus. Well, if we take away an electron from there, will the molecule still be diamagnetic or will it be paramagnetic? Para, yeah, you're gonna have an odd electron. If you take away one of these electrons, up or down, I could care less, you're gonna be left with one of them by itself, and having one unpaired electron will make it paramagnetic. This is also a great segue, because if you have a molecular orbital diagram for a neutral molecule, and you wanna make it positive one, negative one, or something, you can just add or subtract electrons from the MO diagram itself. For Lewis structures, it's a whole other game. You have to recalculate valence electrons, figure out how they go together. Trust me, MO is really cool for positive and negative ions. All right, we're gonna be drawing full molecular orbital diagrams, especially in lab, but at first it's a little weird. Once you get used to the full version of a molecular orbital diagram, you can use what's called MO notation. And you know, scientists and chemists were always limited once in a while to Microsoft Word or one of these, or Google, you know, what are, one of these kind of programs and stuff. So in order to make one of these three-dimensional kind of diagrams onto a piece of paper, the MO notation is really handy. Now, this is the MO for N2 I showed earlier. All right, and instead of drawing this out, and that's what we're gonna do in lab and hopefully in the problems that you're practicing a little bit too, but instead of doing that, this is a shorthand notation. Now, it's still kind of funky, all right, because you gotta use Greek symbols and superscripts and subscripts. However, it is something that can be done in Microsoft Word, Google Pages, but Google stuff like that, um, when you don't have to do this part. Now, I wanna talk about this diagram. If you're going to do this shorthand notation, uh, instead of having a noble gas core, which we did in Chem 221, you want to write in square brackets, core electrons. It's a good day you can abbreviate it just core, but core electrons is the official thing to do, in square brackets. And then with parentheses, you put these little terms right here, all right? So you can see that these electrons right here are in a sigma 2s molecular orbital, and there's two of them. So you would write parentheses, sigma 2s, parentheses, superscript number of electrons. So sigma 2s2. You always do it in order of increasing energy. That's how chemists rule. So the next two would be a sigma star 2s2. Then you can have pi 2p put them together, you're going to separate them for sigma 2, P2. And once you get into it, it's not too bad, <laughs> all right? You can copy and paste the little things around, and it does make it easier. Um, but anyway, so for the shorthand notation, put them in order of increasing energy. Core, or core electrons, is it's cool to have things you don't represent. <clears throat> and then you literally just put them in increasing energy. You don't have to separate the pi's. If you use Google, you'll see like a pi 2px and a pi 2py with two electrons. Don't do that. That's more than we need. You can combine them into one thing. Okay. 
So, uh, here's another question that goes along with the last question we have. And it says, what is the bond order of N2 plus? Okay. Now, the reason why I put this up here is I hid the picture of N2's molecular orbital. But I do have the shorthand notation up here. Now, <clears throat> remember that things with a star are the anti-bonding electrons. And things without the star, which are this, this, and this, are those are the bonding electrons. So in molecular orbital diagram, bond orders one half bonding electrons minus anti-bonding electrons, BE minus ABE if you want to be a lazy chemist like me. Anyway, we can use these diagrams right here to figure this out, all right? So there are two, six, eight bonding electrons. Remember, anything without a star is bonding. So two, four, and two, that's gonna be one half of eight, whoops. And we're gonna subtract from it the anti-bonding, the things with a star. And the only one that's right here is this one right here. So if this was neutral N2, one half, parentheses, eight minus two, one half of six, three, like we saw earlier. Cool. Now, we want the bond order of N2 plus, not N2. Same description, one half bonding electrons minus anti-bonding electrons. If we're making N2 plus, and this is the diagram, are we taking it from a bonding or an anti-bonding orbit? Bonding, yes. The one on the far right is gonna be the easiest one to take. This is a bonding, it doesn't have the little star right there, so it's a bonding electron. So instead of having one half eight minus two, you can go one half seven minus two. That odd electron is gonna come from the highest occupied molecular orbital, which is the last molecular orbital on there. So instead of having eight, we're gonna have one less than we had before, we're gonna have seven, seven minus two and half of that, 2.5. This is a bond order of 2.5, and that would be a lot more difficult to draw a 2.5 bond order in a Lewis structure, but in molecular orbital theory, absolutely you can do that. So, in a shorthand notation, these are the last electrons in, they're the first electrons out. Um, there's a lot of stuff in molecular orbital theory, which is, which is important to know. And the difference be between a lot of these is what's called the homo-lumo gap. Now homo, let's keep your minds out of the gap. Homo, highest occupied molecular orbital. So that would be sigma 2p. And lumo, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And in the diagram up there, the next one would be pi star 2p, although we don't need to know that. So I'm gonna throw around these uh, terms here about homo-lumo gap because it's really important for figuring out when molecules react and stuff. But for us, the highest occupied molecular orbital is the last one. And if you're gonna make a positive one, you wanna take electrons away from that one. So, cool. Questions? Now, sigma and pi bonds, you can find out from these diagrams just as easy. And I've done this a little bit with you already, but I want to make it a little fancier. Because as we've talked about, in the NBC and the FONEs, there's sigma and pi bonding, and pi and sigma antibonding, and knowing which is which is important. Now again, both NBC and phone, the pi star and the sigma stars are always at the end, same order. It's the other ones which flip places a little bit. So these are pi orbitals, sigma orbitals. These are pi stars, sigma stars, et cetera, et cetera. If you have analyzed a molecule correctly, the sigma bonds plus pi bonds will always equal bond order. So earlier, I erased it. I'm sad I did that right now. Let's go back to O2's like, uh, Lewis structure. O2 has a double bond, bond order two. The first bond that I wrote was a sigma bond. The second one, which is pretty slappy up there, is a pi bond. So sigma plus pi equals two 
That's what these things work, and that's how molecular orbital theory will work too. So remember, you can always check yourself here on that. Now, this is the N2 molecular orbital diagram. N2 is NBC, so the top part is pi sigma pi star sigma star, or 2121. Two, one. two orbitals, one orbital, two orbitals, one orbital. That's what the 2121 one means. And when you put in the 2P3 from each nitrogen, you had six electrons total, which filled this up. Well, let's figure out sigma bonds, pi bonds, and bond order all together. Now in green here, I have the green electrons if they're connected to a sigma orbital, all right? And that includes sigma star for this one. The kind of orangish ones here are the ones associated with pi. There's no anti-bonding pi, so that's why those don't appear right there. Well, number of sigma bonds, look at only the green electrons, the ones with the sigmas, all right? And there are two plus two, four bonding sigmas two anti-bonding sigmas, so one half parentheses, four minus two, one sigma bond. If you do the same thing with pi, you wanna just focus on those orange electrons now. So one half parentheses, four bonding electrons, there are no anti-bonding pi electrons, two pi bonds, and again, Bond order, overall bond order, one half essentially six plus two, eight minus two, or one half six minus zero, either way is fine. Bond order is gonna be three. And again, sigma plus pi should equal your bond order if you've done it right. So it's a cool way to check yourself, making sure you've got all the pieces. Questions? Yes, Jennifer? Here are molecular orbital diagrams, excuse me, for the uh, diatomic atoms that are the same. So B2, C2, N2, O2, F2, Ne2. These three are the NBC, all right? And what that means, excuse me, is the pi bonding is lower in energy than the sigma. So you can see that all of these have pi's here and then sigma's here. Now on the right side, we have the phone, F-O-N-E, or whatever you want to do. Sigma is lower than pi, all right? So you can see here how they come together and stuff like that. Um, they say that the difference is due to the SP mixing. I don't know if I totally believe it. Um, let's look at some of these numbers though right here. First of all, this number right here, the first column, these are bond enthalpies, energies required to break the bonds. Now, as bond order goes up, does your bond energy go up or down? Energy is up. Yep, Clifford had to say that because otherwise I'd go and say, Clifford, single handshake. Oh, Clifford, double handshake, triple handshake, right? So Clifford has a reason to say this right away. Thank you, Clifford, once again, for all your help. Anyway, yeah, it's brought that back on. Bond order goes up, bond energy goes up. Bond energy, bond enthalpy, all right? And notice here, we're going from one to two to three, and B to C to N when you do the diagrams. And these numbers are definitely increasing. N2 has 941 kilojoules per mole, B2, 290. On the other hand, on the other side, we're going bond order two, one, and zero, because no one's ever seen dyneon, so that's why that's not there. But you can see how it's going down again, so two is more than one, same idea. Now, bond order goes up, does bond length go up or down? Down, that's right, bond order goes up, bond length goes down. The opposite is seen here. So bond order one is the biggest, bond order three is the smallest, then it starts to get bigger. Now notice like this one is not the same as that one because there's different atoms and stuff like that running around. However, the process is the same. And again, this is the magnetism. So we've got some unpaired electrons there, everything diamagnetic, unpaired electrons again, paramagnetic, these two would be diamagnetic. Um, you can make ions super easy, like I said. So O2 plus, 
uh, O2 neutral would have two electrons right there like we saw earlier. So O2 plus, take one of those electrons from the highest occupied molecular orbital. The last electrons in are the first ones out. So O2 plus, you would take away one of these pi star electrons to make them. Um, it'll change bond order, it'll change magnetism. Uh, O2 plus would have a, a, a bond order of 2.5 and it would be paramagnetic. I'll let you figure that out later and stuff like that. Um, you can also make the negative ions. Now here what I've done is I drew neutral O2 because I didn't have a picture of O2 minus. Anyway, O2 minus has one additional electrons. So we're gonna put that extra electron in the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, the first space available. So it's gonna go in one of these two right here. It's gonna put, put in the pi star 2p. It's still gonna be paramagnetic. Bond order is gonna be 1.5. I'll let you figure that out later, kind of cool. So again, with these ions, make the neutral version first, then you can start adding and subtracting from there. Yeah, Alex. So when we were talking about homo, like the homo's the highest one that has one electron in it. That's right. And then in the abbreviated, it would be the far right in the equation? Well, the homo uh, is, again, the highest occupied molecular orbital. So like for this diagram, the highest occupied is pi star 2p. The LUMO would be the first place an electron could go. So in this diagram, the LUMO is also pi star 2p. There's more room than these. And, and Alex, you could put it on the right or the left. They're both the same energy, so pick whichever one makes you happy. But the homo-lumo gap we're going to talk about probably on Wednesday is kind of cool for doing things like color recognition and stuff like that. So adding that additional electron, does it make it less paramagnetic? In this case, it would be less paramagnetic. That's right. Because now you have a diamagnetic side, if you put it on the left, and you only have one paramagnetic center, you bet. So it would be less paramagnetic with only one electron. Uh, yeah, nice job. Okay, have a great day. We'll take up more of this on Wednesday. Thanks for being here. Have a great day.